So, Lord, we give you thanks that we are your chosen people, that you called each and every one of us by name to be your beloved children. And even though none of us are perfect, we are wonderful and marvelous in your sight. So we think over the past week, we think about all the things we did that were kind and good, but we also remember the things that were perhaps not so good, the mistakes that we made, the arguments that we had, the things that we did that perhaps we shouldn't have done. And we give them all to you. We put them at the foot of your cross, knowing that we are your people, forgiven and redeemed. So we say sorry, Lord. We know that you love us. Amen. So we're now going to have some readings. I, I think I've got some readers. Do I have readers? There's people waving some paper around, which is a good sign. So um, we're going to have uh, a... a re Can you come up? Nancy, do you want me to bring you the microphone? Are you okay to come up? I'll bring you the microphone. So we're going to have a psalm first, and then a reading from John, and then I'm going to take the microphone to Nancy, who's going to read from Romans. Is that okay? Cool. So the first reading is taken from Psalm 132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favour, all the hardships he endured, and how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it in Ephrathah. We heard it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed in righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not run away from the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I w shall teach to them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is uh, John 15, verses 8 to 7, 17. Jesus said, My Father is glorified in this, that you bear plenty of fruit, and so become my disciples. As the Father said, as the Father loved me, Jesus continued, so I love you. Re remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I said these things to you so that, you may, so that my joy may be in you, so that your joy may be, may be full. This is my commandment, love one another in the same way that I loved you. No one has a, long, a, a love greater than this to lay down your life for your friends. Your, you are my friends, if 
you do what I tell you, I'm, I'm not calling you servants any longer. Servants don't know what their master is doing. But I've called you friends because I've let you know everything I heard from my father. You didn't, did not choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my commandment to you, love one another. The third reading is from Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 13. As in one body, we have many limbs and organs, and all the parts have different functions. So we, many as we are, are one body in the Messiah, and individually belong to one another. Well then, we have gifts that differ in accordance with the grace that has been given to us. We must use them appropriately. If it is prophecy, we must prophesy according to the pattern of the faith. If it is serving, we must work at our serving. If teaching, at our teaching. If exhortation, at exhortation. If giving, with generosity. If leading with energy. If doing acts of kindness with cheerfulness. Love must be real. Hate what is evil, stick fast to what is good. Be truly affectionate, showing love for one another. Compete with each other in giving mutual respect. Don't get tired of working hard. Be on fire with the spirit. Work as slaves for the Lord. Celebrate our hope. Be patient in suffering. Give constant energy to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people. Make sure your hospitality to strangers. This is the word of the Lord. So now um, Gav is going to come and speak to us. Do you want me to say a prayer before you? So, Lord, as we've heard your word, help us now to reflect on it together. Please be with Gav as he explores these passages and helps us apply your teachings to our everyday lives. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. It is nice to see you all. Just give me a wave, show me you're, you're there in a wake. Ah, well done. Um, thank you for being here today in church, and church is what I want to talk about today. We're kind of coming out of lockdown, and we're about to go through a refurbishment, in case you didn't know. Uh, we're going to get a heating system, um, and those of you that have been here in December know that's reason to celebrate. Um, so things are going to change, and this is a good time to think about church and how to be church. And that's why we're looking, there's lots of places we could look in the Bible, but we're looking in particular at Romans um, chapter 12. And uh, we've been doing that for the past few weeks, and we've heard a bit of it again today. And the first thing to say about church is that church isn't about church. Just let that sink in for a moment. Church is not about church. Church isn't about making church happen, doing church for church's sake. It isn't about doing church for church's sake. It's not an end in itself. Church is all about God. Church is all about Jesus and what he's done to rescue us and bring us into his kingdom, into new life right here and now where we're forgiven and transformed and healed and loved and loved and loved. And when we're empowered and sent out to share a new way of life with other people. That's what God is up to, one way or another. And he can even do it through the Church of England. My goodness, what a great God we have. He can even do, he can even bring his kingdom 
through the Church of England, and he can even do that through us. And that's what we're going to think about today. We're thinking about what it means to be church here, not as an end in itself, but as part of God's kingdom work. What we can receive from God and what we can do to keep this community going and growing it as well. So we're thinking about service and time and gifts and talents this week. We'll be thinking about money and what we need to do. Some of us have money. Some of us don't have very much money. All of us have something which God has given us. And the more we receive from God, the more equipped we are to go out. So um, chapter 12 in the book of Romans is all about how God's amazing work works out. I said a few weeks ago, read the book of Romans if you can. Some of you may have done that. I hope you have. It just talks about what God has done to rescue out of the fine mess we got ourselves into. He can break us free from all kinds of difficult life circumstances, the difficult things which we grow up with and grow into and which we make for ourselves and which other people make for us. All of that God can reach down and lift us out of the pit, as the Old Testament frequently talks about it, and crown us with His steadfast love and glory, and give us strength and endurance, renewing our youthfulness even. That's what the Psalms say. And one of the Psalms we had today was a vision for building God's house. It talked about King David, how King David swore he was going to do absolutely everything he could to build a house for God, a temple where God's Spirit could live. I won't enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place, a dwelling place for the Lord. Because the Lord, he went on to say, has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. I will dwell here, for I have desired it. I will bless her provisions abundantly. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, with rescue, and her saints will shout for joy. Now, in David's day, the idea was that God stayed in a, in a building, in the temple. When Jesus came, he opened up the kingdom of God to everybody. And now, God wants to dwell in us. That's his temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, we are the body of Christ. As the Spirit of God dwells in us and changes us and loves us and empowers us, so when we get together with others, that power is multiplied and increased. We're meant to be the church together in order to share God's life with each other. And that was in that reading from John as well. Again, if you, I'd recommend going through these readings again later because they're full of such amazing stuff when you stop and think about what it says. It's astonishing. It's the answer to so much need and hurt and pain and difficulty in our world. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you you. As the Father loved Jesus, as God the Father loved God the Son, Jesus, the love that Jesus has, He shares with us. None of us are rejected, abandoned, unwanted, alone. All of us, all of us are loved by God through Jesus. Whatever insecurities, whatever problems and doubts and fears are rankling away inside of us, here's God's answer for you. You don't hear it very much in the news. You don't hear it very much in the culture. You don't hear it very much on the radio. You don't read about it that often. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true now. God loves us and accepts us, has purposes and plans for us. Remain in my love, Jesus says. There are so many temptations, so many things which glisten and attract us, and there are many good things we're meant to enjoy, but above all, we're meant to be drawn to the love and the forgiveness and the healing and the transformation of God through Jesus. As the Father loved Jesus, that's how much He loves us, and we are to remain in His love. And if we remain in God's good purposes and good plans, then we'll do what He wants. We'll be able to live well. We'll become the sort of people 
You can do the sorts of things that Jesus said and God wants of us so that life begins to work properly, not just in us, but in everyone we come into contact with. The kingdom of God is infectious. People long for good things and right things to happen. And it can start to happen as we remain in Jesus' love and do what God wants us to do. It's easy to think sometimes when we're having a bad day or things are going wrong um, or we're just fed up. Oh, they just want me to turn up and do this or at work or at college or wherever. They treat me like a slave. I don't know. The the suffering martyr kind of what my mum used to call old heart the suffering martyr, she used to say when we complained. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had a little moan? It's not like that with God at all. He isn't a hard taskmaster who just has some abstract purpose in mind and he doesn't care just as long as somebody stands up and does it. God first loves us. He draws us into his family as much loved sons and daughters, as much loved children. He first loves us and we are to remain in that love. We're not slaves or servants in that sense at all. We're his friends. We're his children. Jesus says that, I don't call you servants or slaves anymore. The servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But Jesus says, I have called you friends because all that I've heard from my father, I'm making known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Jesus appoints us. There's purpose and plans for our lives. Important ones, good ones, exciting ones. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that there should be something tangible coming from all this, and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give you, and these things I command you so that you will love one another. We receive all of God's love. He changes us. We become the sort of people who can and will do his his will and his ways, and we become the sort of community that people want to join because... There's something about Jesus in it. There's something about God at work among us. We can become a family, a community that people will naturally want to come to as we remain in God's love and do what he wants. That's what church is for. It's to help us become those kinds of people and to bring that kind of way of life wherever we are, at home, at work, at school, at college, at university, wherever it is, we go around being God's people. We remain in his love. And one of the big things that helps to center us in this way of life, to keep us in this way of life, is church. Church isn't an end in itself. It's a means towards God's kingdom working among us and bringing in other people. It's a means to an end, and the end is the kingdom of God. A few months ago, I spoke about, I quoted Dallas Willard, I often do, and um, when he was addressing a bunch of students who just finished their course and they were about to go out into the world, um, he had some simple ideas for them to help them in their life, wherever they were going to serve, whatever they were going to do, whatever they were destined to become and be. Dallas had four ideas to help them cultivate the kind of life that would help them be everything they were meant to be. And the first thing he said was to remember who you are. Remember who you are. We sang about that earlier. Identity is so crucial to how we understand ourselves. People are searching to try and find themselves. People pay psychiatrists a great deal of money to find out who they think they are. Actually, God tells us We're invited to be a child of God, a much-loved son and daughter, the man or the woman that God made you to be. That's who you really are. Remember who you really are. Your identity is there. Another thing Dallas Willard says about who we are is that we're an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. 
Yes, we're a son or a daughter, we're a man or a woman made in the image of God. That's true of everybody. We're not just our bodies, though. We're unceasing spiritual beings. We're going to live with God forever. He has great things lined up for us in his universe. Why don't you say that after me? If you, you feel, I'll say it in three bits, and then we'll turn and say it to each other. Can you say after me? I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Should we say that again? I'm going to say it to someone else. You can turn to someone and say, you, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. You don't hear that on EastEnders. You don't hear that on Match of the Day. You don't hear that in Hollywood movies. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Praise God for that. There is so much purpose and point to our lives. So say that often. I'll give you a handout later which, which records it, but say that to yourself often. Remember it. Remember who you are. That was the first thing in Dallas's list to a bunch of escaping students. The second thing was remember to keep God before your mind. Remember to keep God before your mind. Practice the presence of God. Remember that he is always there. You might feel his presence, you might not, but the truth is God is always where you are. He's always with you. There's so many bits in the Bible that remind us of this. Isaiah 26 verse 3. You keep him, you keep the one in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, focus, brought back to you because he trusts in you. Do you get caught up in anxieties and worries and find your mind just racing over with those things? I often do. Nicky Gumbel said something the other day at our morning worship. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. If you know how to worry, you know how to think a lot about something and dwell on it. The thing to do is think about God. Worry about God. Well, not worry. It's just dwell with God. Remember that he's there. Remember those Bible passages that we've been learning. Remember moment by moment that God is with you. It will change the way you understand and see what's going on in your life and what's going on around you. Practice the presence of God. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Just look to your right for a moment. God is there. Wherever you've just looked, there's a space next to you. God is there. Jesus is with you. And he's inside as well, yes, of course, by his spirit. You're never alone. The great God who created the universe, the God who came and died for us and rose again, the, the God who sends his Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's always there. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness, mercy, there they are. Dwell on those things. Put God before your mind. Remember he's always with you because he because he is. That was the second thing Dallas recommended for our life going forward for some new students who had just qualified and were going out into the world. First thing was remember who you are. The second was remember to keep God before your mind. The third, remember to live sacrificially. Remember to live sacrificially. Does anyone remember John F. Kennedy giving his inaugural presidential address? It was in 1961. Some of you will remember. And he took, spoke about the torch of leading, being passed to a new generation. And do you remember those famous words? He said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. 
And our faith is built on a God who demonstrates sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is right at the very heart of our faith, of our confidence and trust in God. God came, Jesus came in human form and lived among us and for us and died for us and rose again for us. Remember to live sacrificially because when you know who you are, when God is part of your life all the time, the part of your life, when you know those things, when you live those things, then that's what makes sacrificial living possible. Dallas Willard says this, don't strive to advance yourself, let God advance you. This is a deep psychological and sociological truth as well as a profound theological teaching. If you try to save your life in all the ways that the world would have you do it, well, you'll lose it. Instead, give it away. God will give it back to you. Don't make it your aim to get what you want. Serve others. Remember, God gives grace to the humble. He calls us to submit to the mighty hand of God so that when the time is right, he will lift us up. Remember to live sacrificially. Don't live sacrificially if you don't know who you are and you don't keep God before your mind. It'll just be empty legalism. It'll be painful for you and for other people. Remember who you are. Live life with God, present with you. Make that your reality, and out of that, you'll be able to live sacrificially. Now, sacrifice means a lot of different things. A lot of us live sacrificially as it is. If you've got little children, you know what it is to live sacrificially. If you have people who are dependent on you for health reasons, you know what it is to live sacrificially. If you have to do work that you wouldn't naturally enjoy, you know what it's like to live sacrificially. That's the way God calls us to live. Knowing him, knowing our identity in him as his friends, as his family members, empowered and loved by him, makes the sacrificial bit possible. That's how Jesus was able to wash his disciples' feet. Do you remember that story? He knew exactly who he was. He knew his father was with him. And serving that God freed him to do the most menial job there was at that time in service of others. Remember who you are. Remember to keep God before your mind. Remember to live and serve sacrificially. And you need a plan of action to do all this. There are things you can do to make this kind of life possible and real. Church is part of that. Church is part of that. But by itself, that's not enough. Especially if you're a leader in the church. We need routines. We need a way of life, daily, weekly, and annually, which allows us to know God and experience the reality of Him. And there are things that we can do by ourselves, like just taking time to be quiet. My goodness, some of us, when we're quiet and by ourselves, then we begin to discover we've got a soul. We begin to discover our hidden depths. We begin to be able to let out some of the hurt and pain. We become able to receive more when we go for solitude and silence. There are things like scripture meditation. Remember, if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. You can think, make your mind think about good Bible passages. You can learn passages so that they become part of you. Fasting, abstaining from food or other things for a time in order to know God better, in order to realize I don't have to have what I want right now. Praying, interceding for others, worship by yourself and with others. And we can learn little by little to do the commandments. As we forsake anger, we can grow in love. As we practice not getting cross, I'm talking about me here, as we practice not getting cross with drivers on the road in front of us who take 10 minutes to cross one speed bump on hardened roads. That's me. Your mileage may vary. We can learn, that's a chance to learn. I don't have to get my own way here right now. It's okay for me to be delayed by 60 seconds because someone's driving slow in front of me. 
And as I learn that, I can learn to let go of anger and let the power of God's love come in and take over. We empty ourselves of the bad stuff and we fill up with the good. We need a plan of action to do this, to become the people Jesus calls us to be. Remember who you are. Remember to keep God before you. I might just look to your right again. God is there. You can look anywhere. You can look down, sideways, inside, all over. God is there. Meditate on that. Remember to live sacrificially. That's the key to living. When we know who we are and we know God, then we're empowered to live a different way. And remember, we need a plan of action to make all this happen. So how does it all work out? Well, it's all based on what the Bible talks about, what the book of Romans talks about, what Jesus has done to save us and rescue us and to make us new. And then as we are made new, we get together with others who are doing the same thing. Following Jesus is for life, for all of life. Whatever it is God has planned for you, and it doesn't matter how old you are, God has something planned for you now and in it, into eternity. Remember, you're an unceasing spiritual being. And you will get a new body one day when you're raised like Jesus was. What Jesus calls to, the kingdom life he calls to, is when we work out wherever we are, at home, at work, with our families and friends, with our neighbors, at school, at college, wherever it is. And as this work takes place in us, we get together with others. Following Jesus, discipleship is for life, and church is for followers of Jesus, for disciples. We get together and help each other to do this work. That's what church is for. We come to worship God, to encourage and support and help each other, and to reach out with what we've received to other people. If you read the book of Romans and you get to the end. You read all these wonderful theological truths. You read how bad things have got for, you, for humanity, all the things that have dragged us down. Paul doesn't pull any punches when he writes it. Then you hear the story of, well, things were bad, but now God has done something to intervene and make everything good and true and right again, and it comes in Jesus. And it doesn't matter how bad things have got, how bad we've been, how bad other people have been to us. He makes us sons and daughters, and we get filled with his spirit on the inside, and we get to call God Father, cries out within us. We know him. We become part of his family. We know who we are. We know God, and we're empowered to do great things. The book of Romans sets that out so marvelously and then you get right to the end chapter 16 maybe this is a good moment to have those slides up if i can find the reading myself this is right at the very end after expounding all these wonderful things about god and what he's done for us this is where it ends up can we see that is it in there if it isn't i'll just read it not in there is it in there is it in there? Oh, it is there. Thank you. Give me a thumbs up. What we have in Romans chapter 16 is where it all lands, and it lands in a bunch of people living in Rome. Now, the names are a bit unfamiliar to us, but it could be the same bunch of people that I'm looking at right now. Let me introduce you to our sister Nancy. She's a deacon in the church and at Cangria. I want to welcome her in the Lord as is proper for one of God's people. Please give her whatever practical assistance she may need from you. She has been a benefactor to many people, myself included. It says Phoebe, but it could just as well say Nancy. Greet Prissa and Aquila. That could be some of you over there. Fellow workers in King Jesus, they put their lives on the line for me. It isn't only me, Paul writes, but all the Gentile churches that owe them a debt of gratitude. Greet the church in their house. Ooh. So it's not just church in here. The church can be in the house as well. It was in the early days. How many of you are in a home group where you meet one way or another? A few. There's an opportunity for a lot more. Greet the church in their house as well. Greet my dear Epinetus. He was the first fruit of the Messiah's harvest in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junior my relatives and fellow prisoners. My goodness, what was going on there? 
that happens. Who are well known among the apostles and who were in the Messiah before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Urbanus, our fellow worker in the Messiah. It goes on like this. Do you get the idea? All the great, wonderful theological things that God has done works out in a local community of people who know who they are, who know God, who live sacrificially and have a plan of action. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the household of Narcissus. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. I've got some friends who have some friends who have some children called Tryphena and Tryphosa. That's interesting. Uh, they've worked hard in the Lord. That's the point. Greet dear, dear Persis, who has done a great deal of work in the Lord. I could go around this congregation and say exactly the same thing. But so many of us have done so much for such a long time because of this great message that we have in God. There's a warning in there too. I urge you, my dear family, watch out for those who cause divisions and problems contrary to the teaching you have learned. We're a church of recovering sinners, not a museum of perfectly preserved saints. So yes, we do get trouble from time to time. Don't be deceived. Remember who you are in Jesus. Remember God is always with you. Remember to live sacrificially, not selfishly. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends greetings to Lysis and a saucy pattern. Tertius, Gaius, who's host to me, send greetings. Erastus, the city treasurer. Oh, yeah, treasurers. There you go. Sends you greetings, as does another brother, brother Quartus. So Paul ends this magnificent story of what God has done for us in Jesus, what we can take hold of from God, because of what Jesus has done, the forgiveness, the healing, the transformation, the power, the new life, the Holy Spirit in us, empowering us to become new people, bringing a new message to a weary and tired generation. That's where it lands, in a bunch of people like us. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, Paul writes, according to this gospel, the proclamation of Jesus the Messiah, in accordance with the unveiling of the mystery kept hidden for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings, according to the command of the eternal God, for the obedience of faith among all nations, to the only wise God, through Jesus the Messiah, to whom be glory to the coming ages. Amen. Sometimes people say, in order to be happy in life, you have to have a purpose bigger than yourself to be involved in. That's it. The mystery of what the universe is all about is being revealed to us. We've seen God when we've seen Jesus. We know he loves us. We know he died for us. We know he wants to restore us and make us true and good and joyful. I've told you this to make you joyful, Jesus says. To this God, through Jesus the Messiah, be glory in the coming ages. This is what life is really about. And it works out in a little group of people like us. And it works out in the mundane things that we do as well. So when you think about church, remember it's not about church, it's about kingdom life with God. It's about knowing God, knowing who we are, and yes, it's there to help us live sacrificially and to bring this life to others in an, in an ordered way. Following Jesus, discipleship is for life and church is a gathering of disciples so that we can encourage and build each other up and introduce others to this kingdom. Get the good news out there. How do we do that here? I'm going to give you a list. I'm going to hand you out a list soon as well. Some of the things we do. Think about the Eden team, Gavin, Jen, and Heidi working on at the moment. That's a chance to live in this community and do community things for the good of some of the people who live here. And there are some people with a great deal of trouble and difficulty in this community. We can help when we volunteer to live sacrificially, knowing who we are and knowing God. There's kids' work to do on a Sunday. One of the great glories of the church plant when it happened 10 years ago was seeing children come back. That doesn't stop. We need to keep doing that. And we need people to help in big ways, like leading up front, and people to make the tea and the toast. You can do that. This can be part of your plan of action. Gav is going into Cross, Cross Street Academy School at the moment. And he mentioned to me that the school is looking for people to help some of the kids in there with their reading. 
you can make a small difference, which actually will become a big difference to one child's life. Talk to Gav about going into school and doing that. For us to be able to meet together in the way that we are doing, people have to open up the building. People have to make the tea and the coffee afterwards. People have to tidy up and get things ready and tidy things away. You can do that. You can help to welcome people that come in as well. It's the same on Wednesday mornings when we have our traditional service. There are lots of jobs associated with that which make it possible to bring people in and to encourage each other. We do a lot of funerals in this church. We've had a couple of weddings again, praise God, this year. There's a, a need to set up and, and clear up and to welcome people at those events. You could do that. Kim is our administrator. She does all kinds of different jobs, but there are lots of things that need administrating. The Bible talks about administration being one of the gifts that we can use. David and Craig are on the back at the moment doing the tech stuff. We need to train up more people to do tech stuff and, again, help get the message across in the building and put recordings out there and get recordings to people in different ways. This is another practical way you can help bring the kingdom of God as you live sacrificially, part of your life, knowing who you are and who God is. There's the buildings and works to do. Gary's one of the people that does that, along with the church wardens and others. This building needs looking after. There are lots of practical things to do. You could be involved in that. Some of you have been, I know. We like eating. Who doesn't? Not many of us don't like eating. Food is a big part of what we do here. Lots of people help with that. There's Karen and Mandy and Elizabeth who've done so much with the food. Being able to welcome people with food, run Alpha with food, to have food at special occasions, Christmas events and other events. You can do that. That can be part of encouraging the church here and, and helping people share in that good news. The building needs cleaning as well. Heidi and Craig have done a lot of that recently. They've done a great job. Lots of us came for uh, a special cleaning in June, if you, re if you remember. That, is, of course, is ongoing. You can do that. Alpha. Lots of us have come to faith. How many people here have done an Alpha course and found it helpful? Yeah, quite a large proportion. We need to run Alpha again. Maybe your house group, if you're in one, can run Alpha, and you can invite family and friends. Or maybe you want to join a team of people centrally, running an alpha course, just sitting alongside people, helping them, making it happen. You can do that. And we've been working with Patel for many years now. That will start again in some form, we hope. Uh, there's a team being going into the Happy Times Hostel. There are people there who really need to know the reality of Jesus and his kingdom. You could do that. Could you hand out some handouts? Emma, you might need a few more. One lot for one side and one lot for the other. So, What's coming around now is just a couple of those readings. The main points I've communicated today from Dallas Willard about four ways to find your place in this world. Great advice, I think. So profound. It sounds simple, but actually there's so much in there. Remember who you are. Remember to keep God before your mind. Remember to live sacrificially. Remember you need a plan of action. It doesn't happen passively. This is something we've got to choose and do. Following Jesus is for life, and church is for followers of Jesus. Taking part in church life regularly, just being here, is a normal part of following Jesus. And then to support each other and reach out to lots more people. We all play our part in making church happen. It helps keep us growing spiritually and numerically. And my request to you today is to take the sheet home, to look at the readings again, maybe look at Romans again, and to pray. Do you want some more sheets? That's very exciting. Please have a look at this and think and pray. Of course, the list of things on the back isn't exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list. You may think of other things that we are doing that we could do. But what I want to do is, is appeal to you to live this life in God, to know God properly for yourself, to find out who you really are, and then to go for it, that sacrificial living which brings us life and brings life to others too. Jesus says you won't regret it. Church isn't an end in itself. It's a means towards 
kingdom life, making a better world. Thank you, Emma. The great glory in, of who God is and what he's done in Jesus lands in a bunch of people just like us. We are his workers, his co-workers. He had plans and purposes for us before we were born. And some of it is mundane enough to be cleaning the church. And some of it is marvelous enough just to be able to make those connections with people and talk to people or help people who can do that. We all have a different part to play. And what I'm asking you today is go for it. Go for life with Jesus. You won't regret that. He forgives and heals and loves you. You can be a member of his family. Remember, he's with you all the time. It will change you profoundly. Then choose to live sacrificially with the resources of God, with God himself in you and at your side. Remember, this doesn't happen passively. You need to plan for it. Talk about it. Pray about it. Then summon up the courage that God gives you and go for it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the exciting things you did for us to make this world good again, to make us good and joyful again. Thank you that you've broken through sin and shame, hurt and pain, and you lift us up and seat us with you in the heavenly realms right now. Lord, just come by your Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts and minds, give us the vision of who you are, who we are in you, and what we can do when we get stuck into our local church. Lord, we want to see this place grow in spiritual depth and wisdom and maturity. And we want to see this place grow in numbers, Lord, that old and young will come to know you and what love really is through you working in us. That's our vision, Lord, to see you, to know you, to work with you and to bring you to others. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Reassure us that you love us and you have good intentions for us. And then give us the courage to do whatever you're asking us to do, to support each other and love each other in this place and in the work and in the places you have called us to live and, and be. Strengthen us, Lord Jesus, for your name's sake and your glory. Amen. So we're now going to come to our time of peace, but I've been inspired to be a little bit experimental. So this may work, but it may not work, but hopefully you'll be willing to try it with me. So um, just stay seated where you are and just hold out your hands, just like that. We're doing well so far. So close your eyes. And just imagine resting in that love of God that Gav told us about. Just think about who we are and everything we do. And just be re reassured that God loves us. We are unique and special in his sight. You are a child of God. And just imagine God's love filling you up. And with God's love comes God's peace. Just imagine all the stress and all the tension leaving you. We are being filled up with God's peace. From the bottom of our feet, it's filling us up right to the tips of our heads. And there's more than enough of that peace to go round. So in a few seconds, I'm going to say the very familiar words that we all say. And when I say it, I just want you to share that peace with everybody here. But for now, just rest in that love. You are being filled up with God's peace.
So the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. So we're now going to have another song. If you're not too resting in God's peace, if you can stand and if you'd like to stand, we're going to have another song. So we've come to that time where we're going to meet with Jesus again. He's here already and he's with us, I know, but he asked us to do things this way, to remember him and to carry on knowing him. So it's a time of prayer and praise and worship, a time of receiving a piece of bread, which is his body, to remind us that he is with us and in us. We're still being careful with um, COVID still around, so please space yourselves out, come down the central aisle to receive a piece of bread at the right moment, and then go back to your seat by the side aisles, which are the ones appropriate, and um, consume your, your bread there, and then stand and worship God, or kneel, or sit and pray to Him and receive His love. The words on, are on screen as ever. Let's praise and worship God as we meet with Him together. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love, you gave us, Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it, and said, This is my blood, shed for you all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Send your Spirit on us now, that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven, where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. You might like to kneel or sit as we can continue. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and remember his blood, which he shed for you. Eat in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. for our time of prayer. So today we've been discussing what each and every one of us can do for the church. So rather than just me standing at the front and saying some prayers, what we're going to do is we're going to pray together. So before we begin, um, can we do what Gav said? Just look to our right again. Just look to our right again. Um, God is there with you. And he wants to hear what you care about. He wants to hear what's important to you. He wants to hear about 
your worries and your concerns for the world and other people. Because um, if we can worry, we can meditate. That's going to stick with me because if the amount I worry, I must be the, the meditating queen. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll put the prayers into sections and I'll make some suggestions about what you want, might want to pray about. But ultimately, it's up to you. It's you having a conversation with God. So I'll open up each section and then we'll have some silence and you can either pray out loud or quietly in your own heart. It's entirely up to you. And then what we'll do at the end is because we're, we are parts of one body, at the end we will bring all those prayers together and we will give them to God. So let's pray. So Lord, we are your children. And as we rest in your love, we know that you are here with us and you want to hear our prayers. So Lord, we begin by praying for your world. We pray for your wonderful creation. And you might want to pray for the, ongo the ongoing pandemic or natural disasters or the situation in Afghanistan. It's up to you. So in this time of silence, we pray for your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So in this next section, we bring our country before you. You might want to pray for those in power or for the NHS as they prepare for the winter or anything else that, that is put on your heart. So Lord, we lift our country before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we're going to pray for our amazing town of Warsaw. So you might want to think about the college, or the work that the Eden team does, or the manor, or the schools. This is your opportunity to speak with God, to talk about your fears and your hopes for this town. So, Lord, we lift Warsaw before you.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The next word, we'll pray for our church. We'll, you might want to think about all the things that Gav has said today, about all the work that we do, morning prayer, our services, our weddings, our funerals, all the work that the Eden team does. Or, or you might want to pray for the people in the congregation who are struggling with their health or with other situations. So, Lord, we lift this church of St. Peter's to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, this is a chance for us to pray for ourselves. You might want to think about everything that we've talked about today, how we are a child of God, how we can rest in that love of God all the time. You might want to give thanks for all your gifts and your talents and everything you have been called to be. So in this time, let's pray for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we're going to take all our individual prayers and we're going to bring them before God and we're going to lift them up to him as we say our final words for, for, for our prayers. So merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Jesus Christ, amen. And I forgot the words, but that's okay. So notice it. Don't go away, Emma, because we're going to finish off in a moment. Um, yeah, we've run, overrun slightly. That's entirely my fault. So um, I'm going to get Emma to pray a closing prayer in a moment. Just to remind you, uh, we meet on Wednesday morning at 11 for a traditional service, and we're doing the morning, informal morning worship, 9 till 9.30 every morning. Just an informal chance to worship and pray and meet together. If you'd like that in the evenings in some form, for those of you at work or in available in the mornings, let me know. And of course, there's tea and coffee at the back. I can see Heidi and Mandy just waiting to serve you tea and coffee. So please spread out. In, there they are, they're waving. Spread out with some tea and coffee. Talk to someone. Uh, don't rush off. This has been brilliant to see you. So we'll miss the final song, but we'll have Emma's closing prayer, which is going to be brilliant. I won't forget the words. I'll try not to forget the words this time. So let's say a final prayer. So, Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you that we are loved and special in your sight, that you have gifted each of us with a ministry, and that we are loved by you. So, as we go out this week, just be with us, Lord. Strengthen us, comfort us, and guide us in everything we do. Amen. <laughs>